Well then today, the Feast of the Kingship of our Lord, Feast of Christ the King, this last Sunday of October, and uh, we'll be here again in Lita, Oregon. In the epistle for this um, Feast of Christ the King, is taken the St. Paul's letter to Colossians chapter 1. Brethren, giving thanks to God the Father, who has made us worthy to be partakers a lot of the saints in life, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son and His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the remission of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For in Him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers. All things are created by him and in him, and he is before all, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may hold the primacy. Because in him and hath well pleased the Father, that all fullness should dwell. And through him to reconcile all things unto himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, both as to the things on earth and the things that are in heaven. In Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the gospel. Taking that according to St. John, chapter 18. At that time, Pilate said to Jesus, <clears throat> Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Sayest thou this thing of thy said Jew? nation of thee up to me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. For this was I born, and for this came I to the world, that I should give testimony unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, men. Our Lord Jesus Christ, is king and always king. When he was came into this world 2,000 years ago, the first thing that happened was that three kings came to adore him as king. Remember when these three kings came to adore him, he had not yet performed a miracle. He had not yet taught in word. He was just born. He is king. He just is king. He is king because he is the son of his father who is in He is a king, he is a king because he is the son of his father and his humanity. And that he, is, he, he takes on his place as the firstborn of all creation. And he is king. But when this king came into the world, what happened? The second that he arrived, there was a conflict and a war. He didn't say any negative thing. He didn't even say any positive thing. He was just born. He just And he was a baby in a cave with his most magnificent mother and his most quiet foster father. A few shepherds came hearing the songs of some angels. They spread the word to the neighbors that the Son of God had become man. That God was with us, Emmanuel. That the Messiah was born. Three kings came to offer gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There was nothing offensive about this child in anything that he did. He was not offensive in gold, nor frankincense, nor even myrrh. He wasn't offensive in his actions. But the very fact that he is king is an offense. The very fact that he is a king is disturbing. And why is it disturbing? Because in this world, there is a most wicked prince. He is not a king. He is called the prince of this world. And the prince of this world doesn't like the idea of being prince. He doesn't like the idea of being second. He wants to be the king. Therefore, he has been striving to have a coup against the king from the very beginning of time. This coup began when in the very beginning of creation, what happened? God said that he would become man 
and be a king. And the, 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 this, uh, this Lucifer, the, great, the, the prince of the heaven, said, I will not serve, non serviam, I will not serve a God who will become man. I will not serve a God who shall be king in flesh. I won't serve a God who will, who will be in this world as king and remember that he did nothing offensive. He just made a declaration. He just made a declaration. That's all that he did. He made a declaration. The declaration is that he is king. That's all that he did. But, yeah. He made a declaration that he is king, and that's all. And the very fact of his declaration, what happened? There is a war. There is a conflict. There is a battle. Our Lord Jesus Christ is king. The prince never liked this from the very beginning. It doesn't matter what the Lord does. If he is nice, he shall be combated. If he is mean, he shall be combated. If he is quiet, he shall be combated. If he is lying about him. And he pointed out the totality of the war is on kingship. When he said, you complain about John the Baptist, St. John the Baptist, because he fasted. Which means you should be happy if a man does not fast. But now you see that the Messiah has come. But I am come as the Messiah, and I do not fast, and you are offended that I do not fast. Why is it that you're offended that I don't fast, and you're offended that he does fast? You don't care about his fasting, and you don't care about my not fasting. You hate God. <laughs> Father Kramer said a few years ago that the final battle is the battle against the family. This is not the final battle. This is not the devil's final battle. The final battle is a battle of hatred. It is a battle of love and hate. And it must be understood that Satan hates God. He hates the king. He doesn't care whether the king is good or bad. He doesn't care whether whether he's right or wrong, he hates the king. And hence this hatred is so deep in the blood of Lucifer, and whoever follows him by committing any sin, not only mortal sin, but also venial sin, participates in a kind of hatred, a dislike in the case of venial sin, and a hatred in the case of every mortal sin. But as sin progresses, and as sin grows, the hatred becomes more pure. The hatred becomes more complete. We are now in the age of the final battle, and it is a final battle of the complete hatred of God because he's God. It's a complete hatred of Jesus Christ because he's Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what he says or does. He is Jesus Christ. He is God. He is God made man. He is king. He is master, and therefore he is hated. Notice also that our Lord Jesus Christ in his conversation with Pilate, he never, ever acts as though he is not king. Pilate asks him a question. And Pilate says, Are thou the king of the Jews? If Jesus Christ answers, he will be admitting that Pilate is above him. Pilate says, Are thou the king of the Jews? And if he says, Yes, I am, then he is answering the question of his superior. If he says, No, I am not, he is answering the question of his superior. Pilate is not his superior. Pilate is a creature who shall be judged by Jesus Christ and is in fact being judged by him right now. And so the Pilate comes to the king of kings not knowing that he is the king of kings. I was told that thou art a king. And if thou art a king, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have to answer for a few things. What did you do? And I am the judge. So art thou a king? And Jesus Christ does not answer his question because he doesn't answer to the subject. Rather, he says, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or if others told it thee of me? He asked Pilate, Why are you saying these things? Do you say this because you know I am king? Or do you say this because other people told you that I am king? 
How did you come by this information? Notice Jesus Christ is the man in charge. He is in charge, and his hands are tied. He is in charge, and is filled with bloody sweat from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He is in charge, and he has a rabble around him. They want him to be condemned. He never loses his authority. He never loses his position. He is king at every moment of this passion. Therefore, when Pilate says to him, Art thou a king of the Jews? Sayest this of thyself? Or have others said it of thee? Thee of me. Where did you get this information? Notice also that a year and a half earlier, it was an interesting question. Who do men say the Messiah is? Well, prophets. Our Lord Jesus Christ does not say, well, what do you think? How do you feel about the Messiah? Hmm? They would all answer that question. But he looks at those 12 apostles and he says, whom do you say that I am? They are quiet. They are afraid of giving the wrong answer because if they give the wrong answer, they are going to be blasted. He is asking them, whom do you say that I am? He says that because he is God, because he is Messiah, because he is King. They didn't know what to say until the Holy Ghost came down to Simon Peter. And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon, son of John, Simon bar Yona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Thou art no longer Simon, but thou art now Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. Our church is built upon the rock of Peter. When was he called the rock? When Jesus Christ asked him a most important question. Whom do you say that I am? Now we come forward. Art thou a king? I don't care what your opinion is, Pilate. I don't care what the people say, what the newspapers say, whatever. You say that I'm king? That's what he's asking. Are you ready to say that I am king? So how did you come by this, and are you ready to accept me as king? And remember a few days earlier, the Lord Jesus Christ said to all the Jews, If I be lifted up, that is, if I be crucified, you are trying to crucify me. You are trying to kill me. All right? If you kill me, he doesn't say that. No, you can't kill me. He says, if I choose to be killed, he never says, if you kill me. If I choose to be killed and allow myself to be lifted up upon a cross, I will go upon this cross that I may draw all things to myself. They didn't understand what he said, but they heard the word crucified. They heard the word I, and therefore they mocked him and said, you're going to commit suicide. I didn't say that. I didn't say I'm going to be suicide. I said if I allow myself to be crucified and die upon the cross by this means, I will conquer. I will draw all things to myself. What kind of a king is he? He is a king that has come to wage war. He is a warrior. A real warrior is a warrior when he's sleeping. He's a warrior when he's having breakfast. It's a warrior when he plays sports. It's a warrior when he's doing nothing. And occasionally he pulls out a sword and chops off heads. But a warrior is a warrior because that's what he is. He is always warrior. And when this man, when this child became, came into this earth, this most beautiful baby, who was in a little cave surrounded by cows and sheep and goats, this is a warrior. And he is here to conquer. He doesn't need to speak a single word. He doesn't need to preach a single sermon. 
He doesn't need to perform a miracle. He is just warrior. He is just king. And his presence is terrifying to those that love not his father. It is terrifying to those that love not his rule. When the king walks into the room, he walks in, and we immediately turn to ourselves. Am I obeying his law? Am I in the process of trying some kind of coup? Am I a faithful servant? There is terror and anger in those that are not. There is comfort in those that are. For the king has come. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. That's just what he is. And every now and then he performs a miracle. And every now and then he condemns someone to hell who is his enemy. Every now and then he drives devils out of swine. Every now and then he makes sure the lilies of the field are taken care of. He watches over his children in his flock. These are things he does in his spare time. But he is just king. Nobility is in his fingertips. It's in his toes. It's in every part of his being. He is not only divine because he is God. His divinity is everywhere. But his kingship is in his humanity. Just like his priesthood is in his humanity. It is a man alone that can be a priest. Jesus Christ's priesthood is not in his divinity. Man alone on this earth rules as king. In humanity, he is king. There is dignity and there is glory and there is power in his very presence. Who is in that tabernacle? He is king. And his presence is most disturbing and most offensive to those that love God not, who do not love God those that do not follow his law, it is most disturbing. And also, what is he the king of? He is the king of every atom and molecule. He is the king of every star. He is the king of every animal and plant. And he is the king also of those creatures called men. And he is king of the angels. Both the angels that are in heaven... And the ones that are in hell. In hell, the prince tells them what to do in small ways. But the king breathes fire and brimstone from his mouth. And he brings justice down upon them. And he locks him up in prison. What does the king do to the wicked? He locks him in prison. He puts them to death. He puts them to punishment. That's what a king does. And every criminal is under the rule of the king. And they are shown under the rule of the king in the most perfect manner when they are arrested. And when they are put to death. Now these creatures that God made called angels, and these creatures that God made called men, they shall never die. Therefore, he shall show his kingship by making sure that each one of them shall be tied and wrapped together in the tightest possible ball. In the tightest possible ball, they are wrapped together in the center of the earth in the place called hell. And they are squashed by his justice. I will make thy enemy thy footstool, says the Psalms. David speaks of this, and they are the footstool upon which he stands in his humanity. They receive the power of his justice. They hate him. Now the times of the earth are coming to an end. Hence, they're in a final battle. And the final battle is the hatred of God and the hatred of the king versus the love of God and the love of the king. It is time for a battle of hearts. A heart of evil versus the heart of good. What is necessary for us to strive to build up the heart of good inside of my own flesh. The King of kings and Lord of lords wishes to reign in this earth, on this earth, before the day of his final judgment, when he shall perfectly reign over all. 
He allows us during this period between now and the ending of our lives and now and the ending of our world to be able to choose, do I wish to be a servant of the King of Kings or a fool who serves the prince of this world? Which shall it be? Do not think that the devil hates the family. The devil hates flowers. The devil hates God, and this, his hatred is directed solely at God. And God, in his infinite wisdom, and in his infinite mercy, and in his infinite power, created something beautiful called flowers, and something beautiful called the family. And therefore, Satan hates flowers, and he hates the family, only because he hates God. And whoever tries to defend a family, whoever tries to protect a flower, Without God is a servant of Satan and not a servant of God. Flowers are beautiful because they come from God. Family is wonderful because it comes from God, because it is under God, because it is for God, and it is also for the King, Jesus Christ, in his humanity. The King. He is King of kings and King of all other things and Lord of lords. Just because he is. Remember when Moses went to save the Jewish people. They shall ask me, who is asking, who is who sent me? Tell them. Tell the Jews, he who is sent you. He who is sends us priests of the church. He who is sends us Catholics. Out into the world to make the world more and more like unto him and to bring all things under his divine love in the final battle it is love versus hate now what are the signs of love how do we know that someone loves if you're in the charge of a soup kitchen and you're in charge to feed the bums and beggars that come through does it mean you love because you took the gruel out of the bowl and you threw it in their plate? Gruel in their bowl, gruel in their bowl, gruel in their bowl, get out of here. And one of our famous brothers in Phoenix threw the food to the beggar and they said, you know, we serve food from 12 until 4, and 4.01, the beggar came. Did you see the sign there? We feed you till 4 o'clock. <laughs> it's 4.01. That's not charity. Charity? Charity? Tell me about charity. I'm not really doing this because of charity. You know what? I'm a brother. I have to follow obedience. Uh -huh. And it says I feed you burritos between 12 and 4. It's 4.01. Get lost. <laughs> I'm hungry. We'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll give you a burrito. <laughs> It's charity. <laughs> so is charity hanging out burritos? Is charity hanging out soup? Are well, you doing your job? What is charity? Charity is to hand out the soup. Make sure all the soup is cold. Well, I'm going to heat it up a little bit more. It does needs a little more salt. It needs a little more ingredients. It better be served in the right kind of bowl. You can't have soup without crackers. You need to have soup and crackers. There's no crackers. I gotta go pick up some crackers. And you don't just stand up and eat soup. You gotta sit at a table. And you gotta have silverware. And you gotta have time. And then don't forget about whoever eats soup needs to have dessert. You gotta have dessert. Love goes to the details. And love does not give that only which is essential or that which is absolutely necessary or that which is required. Love goes beyond. And we are in the war of love versus hate. Do we love? Only those that love shall be true warriors against Satan. Do we know the truth? Do we believe the essential truth? Or do we love the truth? And every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. So that it matters to me very much that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondwoman and the other by a free. 
It matters to my heart because I love every word that proceeded from the God. It matters that he created this world in six days of 24 hours. And even the morning was the first day. Even the morning, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth day. And the seventh the day, God, who never needs to take a break, rested. God rested. Even though he can't rest because he's always at rest. He rested for 24 hours on that seventh day from the work that was so easy for him to do. He rested. And it matters that he rested. And it matters every word that he speaks in the Holy Scripture. This universe. It matters that the sun doth go around the earth and not the center. It is not the center of the Milky Way. It is not the center of the galaxy. It is not, does not go around the sun. It matters every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God in sacred scripture. It matters every word that proceedeth and every desire that comes from him. Why? Because we love. We're in the war of love versus hate. Now consider the enemy. Is the enemy satisfied if you're in the state of mortal sin? Is the enemy satisfied as long as you're in mortal sin and go to hell? Absolutely not. Because he hates with a perfect hatred. He wants all girls to be ugly to the core of their bone, the core of their being. Hence the modern dress. Not only impure, but disgusting. He wants femininity destroyed. He doesn't just want girls in hell. He wants to have nothing left of girlhood in a girl. He wants nothing left of manhood in a man. He wants nothing left of animals and animals. He wants to, he wants to destroy all the crops. He wants to destroy all the plants. He wants to genetically modify every single plant. He wants to destroy the clouds with the chemtrail. Satan hates the water. Satan hates the food. Satan hates every detail of femininity, from the dress all the way to the greatest detail, because he hates. If he only had a small hatred, he would be satisfied that this person died and went to hell, and that one died and went to hell. But then spreading and spreading, we are in the final war of the hatred of satanic followers of the prince of this world fighting against the divine love. Not the divine love that is in heaven, but the divine love that is to be found on this earth in human flesh. Now when love fights hatred, perfect hatred defeats wimpy love. And perfect love destroys hatred. Completely. It is perfect love that we must strive to obtain in our lives in order to be warriors of the King. The very presence of the man of God. He needs not speak a single word. He needs not make a single reproof. He just needs to be present. And it should make the enemies angry and filled with hatred. In the very presence of God was offensive. That little baby was offensive. And Joseph, St. Joseph, had to take that baby and flee into the land of Egypt, which is the place of sin. That's where all evil comes from. That's where Satanism comes from. He left the land of Israel, the land of promise, and he fled to the land of Egypt, the land of sin. And there he was safe for seven years. And then he came back. He was not killed by the Egyptians. He was killed by his own people. The hatred and wickedness of the Egyptians did not harm him. It was the hatred and wickedness of his own people. <coughs> That's why Lord Jesus Christ says to Pilate, If my kingdom were of this world, I would be kept away from the Jews. My soldiers would keep me from the Jews. But my kingdom is not from hence, and therefore I am with the Jews. Now this tells us a negative thing and a positive thing. This, this world ruled by Jews is going to be a terrible place. We don't want to be in this world ruled by Jews. And the other is, Jews aren't meant for this world. We are not all like unto the Jews. They are the chosen people. They aren't meant for this world. They're meant for heaven. 
They're meant to be the people of God, the people of God. All of us are people of God. But none of us can say we have his flesh in our flesh unless we are Jews. People of God, because they have the same flesh that he has. They are not made for this world. They're made for the next. Therefore, as we say in Latin, corruptio optimi pessimi, the corruption of the best is the worst. Those that are made for heaven, in their own flesh made for heaven, when they live for this earth and try to rule on this earth, it shall be most wicked, it shall be most horrible. There shall be nothing worse. But then one day, towards the ending of the world, because his kingdom is not of this world, notice he says, he didn't say my kingdom is not in this world. It's not of this world. It's not from this world. There's something divine about Jewish flesh. All other flesh is only human. But there's something sacred about Jewish flesh. It doesn't come from this world. It comes from the next world. It's reserved by the line of promise. It is reserved by the sacred and miraculous protection of heaven down the 4,000 years of the Old Testament from Abraham all the way, in fact, to the end of the world. And how is this flesh continued in the New Testament? It is in the New Testament in the flesh of priesthood, in the flesh of episcopacy, in the flesh of the presbyterate, of the religious life, the priests. This flesh is continued in a divine way also. It was the divine protection that protected the Jewish people from the outside. But in the New Testament, the divinity protects by ordination, by a bishop putting his hands on the head of a young man and making him priest. And his flesh becomes sacred, so sacred that it's a mortal sin to strike a priest. Including if a priest strikes another priest. The flesh is sacred. We must understand that Jesus Christ is king in his humanity. He is noble in his humanity. He is good in his humanity. And his humanity is flesh. And he wants his kingship to be inside of all flesh. And how does it enter? By love. How does it depart? By hate. Therefore, in this great battle against hell, let us grow in a true and real and deep divine love. Let us have the heart of Jesus Christ inside of us. And this heart is going to conquer Satan. We know that God always conquers Satan, and Jesus Christ in his human flesh has already conquered him. The only question is, shall my flesh conquer Satan? Shall your flesh conquer Satan? Or shall our fleshes be conquered by Satan? It all depends. Is that true faith? Love inside of me? Or does hatred take over my heart? Let us be sure and make sure that love is that which takes over our heart. Or just by being that we are an offense to the enemy. By being in love to God, with God, and with His Most Holy Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and with His Most Holy Mother, the Church, and with His Spouse, the Church, and our Holy Mother, the Church, in love with His Sacred Scripture, in love with His wishes and whims, in love with all the things He created, in love with our enemies, because they are also made by God. This love must pour from us because that's the love that is in our king. It must be contagious. And it must spread. And when this love spreads, this Satan shall be wiped out. He shall be defeated and eliminated completely. There shall be nothing left of him. Let us persevere in the love of God. Remember that our king is king. And on the side, he does a few things. Smash some devils once in a while. Perform some miracles once in a while. And take care of us all the time. But we love him because he is king. And St. Thomas is honored just because it is most noble. And our world today has become more and more ignoble. And therefore it hates nobility. It hates love. It hates the heart of our king. Let us make sure that the heart of his divine love, the human love rather, the sacred heart, that that heart comes inside of us and goes out to conquer the whole world for him in our flesh. 
in our flesh. And the Buddha goes, you all, and the Father and the Holy Ghost.